So also from me, thank you very much everybody for joining us this evening for a talk on consciousness, cosmic and human. <clears throat> In Madame Blavatsky's collected writings, we can read, to give the merest outline of the states of consciousness is the most difficult thing in the world. Since the universe is embodied consciousness and a knowledge of the states of consciousness means a knowledge of the planes of the universe and of all correspondences in the cosmos, the solar system and man. A note by the editor points out that cosmos spelled with a K was used by Madame Blavatsky in the sense of the Manvantaric manifestation as a whole. She often applies the adjective cosmic with a C to phenomena of the solar system and speaks of that system as the cosmos. Unfortunately, this distinction was constantly missed by proofreaders and we meet the term cosmos applied to the solar system as she would have written cosmos. And Madame Blavatsky confirms herself again that the study of the states of consciousness is confined to consciousness as manifested in the solar system. Any attempt to figure consciousness in cosmos would have deceived the students by inducing him to believe that such cosmic consciousness could be explained. Whereas the whole of even the lowest plane of cosmos transcends the highest added on earth. As to its explanation in material words, try to confine infinitude in a nutshell, she says. One thing alone we know of cosmic consciousness is that it is absolutely outside all terms of earth consciousness. To know oneself necessitates consciousness and perception, but consciousness implies limitations and qualifications, something to be conscious of and some, someone to be conscious of it. But absolute consciousness contains the cognizer, the thing cognized, all three in one, uh, cognized and the cognition, all three in one and all, uh, all three in one and all in itself. When Madame Blavatsky was questioned by her students on this subject, she gave a very unique description that the absolute or the attribute and secondless reality is dormant, latent mind. It is absolute consciousness eternally, which consciousness becomes relative consciousness periodically at every manvantaric dawn or new cycle of activity. Let us picture to ourselves this latent or potential consciousness as a kind of vacuum in a vessel, she says. Break the vessel and what becomes of the vacuum? Where shall we look for it? It has disappeared. It is everywhere and nowhere. It is something, yet nothing. A vacuum, yet a plenum, or the absolute container of all that is, whether manifested or unmanifested. But what in reality is a vacuum, she asked. Is not absolute vacuum a figment of our fancy? A pure negation, a supposed space where nothing exists. This being so destroy the vessel and, to our perception at any rate, nothing exists. Therefore, stanza two of the secret doctrine puts it very correctly. Universal mind was not, because there was no vehicle to contain it. In the poem of the secret doctrine, we can read as well that space is neither a limitless void or vacuum or conditioned fullness, but both. On the plane of absolute abstraction, it is the ever incognizable deity, which is void only to finite minds. And on that plane of myavic perception, it is a plenum or absolute container of all that is 
that are manifested or unmanifested, therefore that absolute all. In his book, A Beautiful Question, Finding Nature's Deep Design, Frank Wilschek, Nobel Prize laureate and professor of physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology also writes, the vacuum of interstellar space is permeated by a variety of quantum energy fields. That the word vacuum does not refer unambiguously to a definite thing. And that the philosophical concept of void or space as perfect nothingness is quite different from any reasonable understanding of physical space in the present day physical world. In modern physical cosmology, it is important to take into account that space filling fields, such as the electromagnetic field, for example, or the newly discovered Higgs field, have profound physical effects, he says altering the behavior of matter and contributing to that dark energy. They are pervasive and inescapable. The behavior of matter within these different vacuums can be drastically different. It is suggestive that space itself is a sort of material that can exist in different phases, just as water can exist as liquid water ice or steam. If such diverse regions of space exist, then the universe as we have defined it is not the whole reality, he says. The secret doctrine explains it like this. The initial existence in the first twilight of the Mahamanvantara or active period is a conscious spiritual quality. In the manifested worlds, it is, in its objective subjectivity, like a film from a divine breath to the gaze of the entranced seer, a colorless spiritual fluid. It exists everywhere and forms the first upadi, the foundation or vehicle, on which our solar system is built. But apart from cosmic substance, cosmic ideation could not manifest as individual consciousness, since it is only through a vehicle of matter that consciousness wells up as I am I. A physical basis being necessary to focus a ray on the universal mind at a certain stage of complexity, says the Mahatma Kutumi. Apart from cosmic ideation, Cosmic substance would remain an empty abstraction and no emergence of consciousness could ensue. In her book, Psychic and Noetic Action, Madame Ravatsky writes, every phenomenon in the visible universe has its genesis in cosmic motion, which is called the great breath in the secret doctrine, producing sound at the same time beginningless and endless. For the eternal life, the basis and genesis of the subjective and objective universe, of which molecular motion is the lowest and most material of its finite manifestation. Occultism regards every atom as an independent entity and every cell as a conscious unit. As soon as atoms group to form cells, the latter become endowed with consciousness of its own kind, and that memory has its seed in every organ of the body. It further teaches that within mortal man there is an immortal entity called divine mind or nous, whose pale reflection is what we call mind and intellect in man an entity apart from the former during the period of incarnation. It is rational, but physical, encased in and bound by matter, subject to influence of the higher mind or the all conscious self, and is that which reincarnates periodically. The higher self or individuality is always the same 
while its reflected double changes with every new incarnation and personality and is conscious only for a life period, being influenced by all the chaotic stimuli of the animal passions of the living body. Self-consciousness belongs to man alone and proceeds from the self or higher manas or mind. Only the psychic element, the karma manas, in Sanskrit is common to both animal and human being. Although in a far higher degree in man due to the greater perfection and development of the cerebral cells. Between the psychic and the noetic, or the personality and the individuality, there exists an abyss which could be compared to Jack the Ripper and the Holy Buddha, says Madame Blavatsky. It becomes patent what we could not perceive even with the help of the best earthly telescope that which is outside our world of matter. Those alone whom we call adepts, who know how to direct their mental vision and to transfer their consciousness, both physical and psychic, to other planes of being are able to speak with authority on such subjects. And they tell us plainly, lead the life necessary for the acquisition of such knowledge and power and wisdom will come to you naturally. Whenever you are able to attune your consciousness to any of the seven chords of universal consciousness, those chords that run along the sounding board of cosmos, vibrating from one eternity to another. And you have studied thoroughly the music of the spheres. Then only will you become quite free to share your knowledge with those with whom it is safe to do so. Because by reflection, self-knowledge and intellectual discipline the soul can be raised to the vision of eternal truths, goodness, and beauty. In his book, The Tao of Physics, Dr. Friedrich Kapra wrote, five years ago, his book was published in 1976, I had a beautiful experience which set me on the road that has led me to write to the writing of this book. As I was sitting by the ocean one late summer afternoon, watching the waves rolling in and feeling the rhythm of my breathing, when I suddenly became aware of my whole environment as being engaged in a gigantic cosmic dance. Being a physicist, I knew that the sand, rocks, water, and air around me were made of vibrating molecules and atoms and that these consisted of particles which interacted with one another by creating and destroying other particles. I knew also that the Earth's atmosphere was continually bombarded by showers of cosmic rays, particles of high energy undergoing multiple collisions as they penetrated the air. All this was familiar to me from my research in high energy physics. But until that moment, I had only experienced it through graphs, diagrams, and mathematical theories. As I sat on that beach, my former experiences came to life. I saw cascades of energy coming down from outer space in which particles were created and destroyed in rhythmic pulses. I saw the atoms of the elements and those of my body participating in this cosmic dance of energy. I felt its rhythm and I heard its sound. And at that moment, I knew that this was the dance of Shiva, the Lord of dancers worshiped by the Hindus. And he quoted Werner Heisenberg, a German theoretical physicist and one of the key pioneers of quantum mechanics who once said, it is probably true quite generally that in the history of human thinking, the most fruitful developments frequently takes place at those points where two different lines of thoughts meet. 
these lines may have their roots in quite different parts of human culture, in different times or different cultural environments or different religious traditions. Hence, if they actually meet, that is, if they are at least so much related to each other that a real interaction can take place, then one may hope that new and interesting developments may follow. Another example of how we can suddenly experience a conscious glimpse of our inner connectedness with our life and what consequences it can have was revealed by Dr. Edgar Mitchell, a scientist, test pilot, naval officer and astronaut. On the 31st of January, 1971, he embarked on a journey some 500,000 miles through outer space with two of his colleagues to become the six men walking on the moon, safely and successfully returning on the 9th of February, 1971. This was a dream come true for Edgar Mitchell since earliest childhood. When it finally happened, he could not imagine what a profound impact it would have on his future life and in a very unexpected way. The mission to the moon was not without some problems, but the job could be finished very successfully. And then, on their way home to Earth, something very astonishing happened to Mitch. A wonderful quietness drifted into the cabin on their flight back, he said. All that was needed to be done now was to monitor the spacecraft systems, which functioned perfectly. He could lean back in weightlessness, watching the slow progress of the heavens through the module window when a great tranquility started to surround him. A growing sense of wonder as he looked out of the window. There was not a hint of what was about to happen. He was tuned into something much larger than himself, larger than the planet in the window. Something incomprehensibly big, he says, which still baffles him today. He died in 2016. There was an initial awareness that the planet in the window they were heading to again harbored much strife and discord beneath the blue and white atmosphere, which had such a peaceful and inviting appearance. But looking beyond the Earth itself to the magnificence of the larger scene, there was a startling recognition that the nature of the universe was not what he had been taught. There was an upwelling of fresh insight coupled with a feeling of ubiquitous harmony, a sense of interconnectedness with the celestial bodies surrounding the spacecraft, a kind of silent authority that shook him to the core. Suddenly, from behind the rim of the moon, in long slow motion, moments of immense majesty, there emerges a sparkling blue and white jewel, a light, delicate, sky blue sphere, laced with slowly swirling veils of white, rising gradually like a small pearl in a thick sea of black mystery. It takes more than a moment to fully realize this is us, home. On the return trip home through 240,000 miles of space towards the stars and the planets from which I had come, I suddenly experienced the universe as intelligent, loving, harmonious. My view of our planet was a glimpse of divinity. We went to the moon as technicians. We returned as humanitarians. For some precious moments, Mitchell had touched some higher levels of consciousness, which much later and more experienced with the practice of meditation, he could recognize and describe as a state of Savikalpa Shamadi, a level of consciousness where one still observes things as separate from oneself, yet is able to recognize that they are all connected to each other and to oneself 
that this separation is just an illusion. It is a kind of preliminary step to the experience of Mary Kalpa Shamari, he says, where complete union with the cosmic self is achieved. After such an experience, nothing will ever be the same again. One year later, in 1972, Mitchell left the US Navy, turning his investigation from the outer to the inner worlds, to the study of human consciousness as well as psychic and paranormal phenomena, trying to prepare a common ground between science and spirit. In 1973, he founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences with the German aerospace and rocket engineer Werner von Braun, a very prestigious and non-profit making organization by now, sponsoring research into the nature of consciousness and related subjects. There is one general law of vision physical and mental or spiritual, says the Mahatma Gautama. But there is a qualifying special law proving that all visions, vision must be determined by the quality or grade of man's spirit and soul, and also by the ability to translate diverse qualities of waves of astral light into consciousness. There is but one general law of life, but innumerable laws qualify and determine the myriads of forms perceived and of sounds heard. The field of vision or of thought is like a sphere whose radi proceeds from oneself in every direction, and it stands out into space, opening up boundless vistas all around, whose center is everywhere and circumference nowhere. All things that ever were, that are or that will be, having their record upon the astral light or tablet of the unseen universe, the initiated adept by using the vision of his own spirit can know all that has been known or can be known. Through the interplanetary and interstellar space is the vision of almost every clairvoyant can reach. But it is only the trained eye of the proficient in Eastern occultism that can fix the flitting shadows and give them a shape and a name. For it will be evident that as soon as the least feeling of selfishness tries to assert itself, the vision of the spiritual sense, which is the only perception of the Mahatma, becomes clouded and he loses a power which abstract knowledge alone can confer. Hence, we have constantly to exercise the vigilant watch of the will to prevent our lower nature from coming up to the surface which it does in our present undeveloped state. And thus extreme activity and not passivity is the essential condition with which the student has to commence. First, his activity is directed to check the opposing influence of the lower self. And when that is conquered, his untrammeled will centered in his higher real self continues to work most efficaciously and actively in unison with the cosmic ideation in the divine mind. The secret doctrine tells us that the accumulated wisdom of the ages is handed down to us in uninterrupted records from time immemorial by generations of initiated seers who had checked and testified in every department of nature, the traditions of old, by the independent vision of great adepts, men who had developed and perfected their physical, mental, psychic, and spiritual organization to the utmost possible degree. No vision of an adept was accepted till it was checked and confirmed by the vision 
so obtained as to stand as independent evidence of other adepts and by centuries of experience. Confronted with a strange behavior in the subatomic world, many scientists and especially quantum physicists have turned for inspiration to the philosophy of esoteric teachings or the perennial wisdom tradition, as can be found in the Vedas and Upanishads. Buddhism, as well as Hermetic philosophy and Platonism, especially when the mystery of consciousness is involved. So what seems to be the trend in the 21st century? In the 1990s, Stuart Hameroff, professor of anesthesiology at the University of Arizona, teamed up with Sir Roger Penrose, professor of mathematics at Oxford University trying to solve in a united effort as far as possible the mystery of consciousness, how it comes about and what its transmitters are. You all know what it is like to be conscious or have awareness, but what is this conscious mind? How can the subjective nature of our phenomenal experiences or our inner life be explained in scientific terms, they asked themselves. The universe is perfectly tuned. The physical parameters are measurable aspects of a system determining physics, chemistry, and biology, like the mass of a proton, the charge of an electron, etc., are precisely what they need to be to produce stars, light, life, and consciousness. If any of these parameters were even slightly different, we would not exist. Traditional religious systems suggest that God produced the physical parameters as they are. Some modern scientists take the view that there must be an infinite number of parallel universes or the multiverse, that we just happen to be in one of them that supports consciousness, the so-called anthropic principle that is able to ask these questions. But meanwhile, another very interesting theory has emerged. Sorota Penrose suggested serial rather than parallel universes, aeons within an overall universe, that the Big Bang was preceded by a previous aeon, one preceding the other or mutated in an evolutionary process. But then the question was, what is the universe evolving towards? As mentioned above, in the 1990s, Sir Roger Penrose teamed up with Stuart Hameroff, whose professional job as an anesthesiologist had been for decades to take people's consciousness away and to restore it again after a certain time during an operation. Together, they developed a theory which is called orchestrated objective reduction, which roughly co contains the following assumptions. Consciousness is a process intrinsic to the fine scale structure of physical reality or fundamental space time geography at the Planck scale, named after the German physicist Max Planck which is the smallest measurement of a length or of time with any meaning. But beyond that, there is still information in the subjective realm that the physical parameters are embedded and determined. If so, then the obvious conclusion would be that with the Big Bang and rebirth of the universe, the physical parameters may slightly change or mutate in an evolutionary process. This is would mean that the universe is evolving to optimize consciousness. Secret option expresses it like this. Nature runs down, a process called entropy today, and disappears from the objective plane only to reemerge after a time of rest out of the subjective and to re reascend once more. Our cosmos and nature will run down only to reappear on a more perfect plane after every prior interest. 
Hamerovs and Penrose's hypothesis is that spiritual and contemplative traditions, as well as some scientists and philosophers, consider consciousness to be intrinsic, woven into the fabric of the universe. That conscious precursors, platonic forms, and ethical values, values are preceding biology, existing all along in the fine scale structure of physical reality. That it is consciousness which is deriving the universe. Hamarov compares it with her Hindu philosophy called Brahman, the essence of an omnipresent and aware universe. That Atma would then be an individualized ripple of that consciousness, spirit in the fabric of space and time, coalescing in a particular region with this underlying fabric of the universe, the container of all potentialities. That there is an inner connectedness among human beings and the essence of the universe, a field of quantum vibrations containing containing platonic values or ethics, which humans can access as a kind of divine guidance. That the quantum vibrations of consciousness are more like music than computation or mathematical calculations. The physical medium for consciousness to occur in the brain seem to be microtubules, the largest filaments within cell structure of the brain neurons, Penrose and Hammerov propose that aspects of quantum theory, like the phenomenon of wave function self collapse, are essential for consciousness to occur. The particular char characteristics of microtubules for such quantum effects include their crystal like lesser structure. They are hollow tubes around which are subunits called tubulins or globular proteins asymmetrically arranged, that they cooperatively interact, having the same frequencies as our ultrasound. They can be assembled and disassembled as required by the cell. Not only can they connect with the brain as a kind of quantum computer, but also to the universe itself. Monitoring the brain waves of dying persons by using an electroencephalogram showed amazing results. About 80 to 100 megahertz is our usual scale of consciousness. 14 to 60 when anesthetics, lower frequencies are a sign of brain damage. When the heartbeat of a dying person stops, the brain waves drop to zero but then something extraordinary happens. Suddenly an absolute burst of activity up to 19 megahertz appears in the neurons of the brain again for about 90 seconds to 20 minutes, even with patient, patients who are brain dead as well as animals. One could say that death seems to be the most awake moment which the scientists interpreted as a soul leaving the body and the person experiences all the stages of his or her life like a film, as reported from near-death experiences. This led to the argument of an eternal soul. Since the soul as an individualized unit of the very fabric of the universe itself, it acts as a quantum container of stored information of a person's life experiences and can exist outside the body, or with other words, survive it in a kind of entangled quantum soul with all the necessary ingredients of accumulated experiences and latent possibilities for further evolution. And since is it able to attach itself after an out of body experience to the existing body once more, why should it not be able to attach itself again to a new body in form of a reincarnation in an evolutionary process of optimizing its conscious awareness for its spiritual destiny, said scientists. I think more like a quantum Buddhist, says Stuart Amor. 
in that there is a universal proto-conscious mind which we access and can influence us. But it actually exists at the fundamental level of the universe at the Planck scale. Professor Stuart Hammer of Sir Roger Penrose and Dr. Zubash Park from the State University of Oklahoma published a book in 2009 called Consciousness and the Universe, a compilation of articles by different authors on quantum physics, evolution, brain, and mind. The last contribution is on how consciousness becomes the physical universe written by Professor in Computational Physics, Minat Tafatos, Professor of Neurology, Rudolf Tanzen, and Dr. Deepak Chopra, Advocate of Alternative Medicine. In the chapter on consciousness and quantum theory, there is a quote from Werner Heisenberg, one of the key pioneers of quantum mechanics who served in his Nobel Prize speech in 1932, that the atom has no immediate and direct physical properties at all. <clears throat> if the universe basic building block is not physical, the logical conclusion would then be that this applies to the whole, wrote the above mentioned authors of this article. Whatever the fundamental source of creation, it itself must be uncreated, they say. Otherwise, there is a hidden creator lying in the background, and then we must ask who or what created it. What does it mean to be uncreated, they ask. The source of reality must be self-sufficient, capable of engendering complex systems on the micro and macro scale self-regulating and holistic. Nothing can exist outside of its influence. Ultimately, the uncreated source must also turn into the physical universe, not observe it as a god of the gods do in conventional religions. Only consciousness fits the will. For as a prima facie truth, no experience takes place outside of consciousness which means that if there is a reality existing beyond our awareness, counting mathematics and the laws of physics as part of our conscious experience, we would never be able to know it. The fact that consciousness is inseparable from cognition, perception, observation and measurement is undeniable. This is a starting point for new insight into the nature of reality. We take it as a field phenomena, analogous to but preceding the quantum field. It is complementary, non-local, and undivided wholeness. We cannot define it from the outside. Consciousness includes human mental processes, but it is not just a human attribute. It was there before. In essence, space and time sprang from primordial consciousness. The reason that human minds mesh with nature, mathematics, and the fundamental forces of nature described by physics is no accident. We mesh because we are a product of the same conceptual expansion by which primordial consciousness turned into the physical world. We cannot extract consciousness from the physical universe despite the fervent hope of materialists and reductionists, they say. They are forced into a logical paradox for either the molecules that make up the brain are inherently conscious, or a process must be located and described by which those molecules invent consciousness. Such a process has not and will never be specified. It would amount to saying that the table salt, once it enters the body, finds a way to dissolve in the blood, enters the brain, and in so doing learns to think and reason. Positing consciousness as more fundamental than anything physical is the most reasonable alternative. 
The integrated approach will one day prevail and science will become much stronger and develop to the next level of understanding nature to everyone's lasting benefit, say the scientists. Nothing in nature springs into existence suddenly, says the Mahatma Kutumi, all being subject to the same law of gradual evolution. The one life is closely related to the one law which governs the world of being, karma. He sent me withered before the mystery of our own making and the riddles of life that we will not solve. But verily, there is not an accident in our lives, not a misshapen day or misfortune that could not be traced back to our own doings in this or in another life. The law of karma is inextricably interwoven with that of reincarnation. It is only this doctrine that can explain to us the mysterious problem of good and evil and reconcile man to the terrible and apparent injustice of life. Nothing but such certainty can quiet our revolted sense of justice. For when one unacquainted with the noble doctrine looks around him and observes the inequalities of birth and fortune, of intellect and capacities, when one sees honor paid to fools and profligates, on whom fortune has heaped her favors by mere privilege of death, bare birth, and the nearest neighbor with all his intellect and noble virtues, far more deserving in every way, perishes for want and for lack of sympathy. When one sees all this and has turned away helpless to relieve the undeserved suffering, one's ears ringing and heart aching with the cries of pain around him, that blessed knowledge of karma alone prevents him from cursing life and man as well as the supposed creator. This law, whether conscious or unconscious, predestines nothing and no one. It exists from and in eternity truly, for it is eternity itself. And as such, it cannot be said to act, for it is action itself. Karma creates nothing, nor does it design. It is man who plans and creates causes, and karmic law adjusts the effects, which adjustment is not an act, but universal harmony, tending ever to resume its original position. Karma has never sought to destroy intellectual and individual liberty, like the God invented by the monotheist. Karma is an absolute and eternal law in the world of manifestation. And as there can be only one absolute, as one eternal, ever-present cause, believers in karma cannot be regarded as assets or materialists, still less as fatalists. For karma is one with the unknowable, of which it is an aspect in its effect in the phenomenal world. I would like to close now with a paragraph from the Dead Sea, Dead sea Scrolls, the Book of Hymns. I have reached the inner vision, and through thy spirit in me I have heard thy wondrous secret. Through thy mystic insight thou hast caused the spring of knowledge to well up within me, a fountain of power pouring forth living waters, a flood of love and all embraces, embracing wisdom, like the splendor of eternal light. Peace be with you. Thank you.